from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stump. Hello, welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell in London, where we're allowed to meet indoors once again. Also got some of the first spectators into county championship matches. And I did a little bit of canoe kayaking at the weekend as well. A great way to catch up with some friends. Even though we're allowed indoors, I'm still pretty keen to get outdoors as much as possible. Although this May weather is not exactly making that too easy at the moment. Who would have thought that it's the English summer? You're so versatile. One moment you're playing a guitar on horseback and now a guitar <laughs> on a kayak. Um, <laughs> keep it going, Ali. What an athlete. Uh, I'm not so athletic here, although today I've been at the uh, primary club, the Cricketers Charities uh, Annual Golf Day. More on the 19th and the course, but uh, our patron, Mark Taylor, was in the winning team. So, funnily enough, he was sitting at the same table as I was sitting. And funnily enough, we talked about Ball tampering. More of that later. Charu. <laughs> well, I'm glad you guys are getting out and about, uh, unfortunately, in India. And I, this is not meant to be a COVID update, by the way, but just want to fill you in that we're still suffering from all sorts of uh, mixed signals, should we say. On one hand, there is some bettering of the situation. And on the other, I think yesterday, was it, uh, India posted a, a death count of over 4,600 or so, which is the highest single day death number around the world ever. So, you know, a little dark and depressing. But cricket-wise, luckily, I think people are getting over the postponement or suspension or whatever of the IPL, and people are beginning to look a little more forward to the World Test Championship, which will happen in a couple of weeks now uh, in England. So there is movement on the sport, but not in India so much more outside of India. Yeah, that's right. It's still such a sad situation in India at the moment. Jim, just, just to let you know, my, my canoeing was on a canal. So there were no waves to contend with or rapids. <laughs> it was very flat. But yeah, it was, it was good fun. It was good fun. So, yeah, Charu, you mentioned the World Test Championship and indeed New Zealand men have arrived in the UK ahead of that match and then also the two test matches against England, which precede it. Now, one of the new boys who's hoping to make his debut is 21-year-old all-rounder Rachin Ravindra. Now, Rachin's parents are both Indian. They moved to New Zealand in the late 1990s. When Ratchin was younger, though, they weren't sure if he would even be able to play cricket because he had a heart murmur. Fortunately, though, he's all OK now. And I've been chatting to Ratchin about his Indian heritage, the supportive family that he's part of and what it's like being in quarantine in Southampton. It's crazy to know that the opportunity we can have to play cricket in these sort of times. And it's, I mean, credit to the ECB for having us and stuff, but it's been pretty good so far. The environment's been, well, not necessarily relaxed, but it's been easy to settle into, although it is isolation, but they treat us really well here and the ability to look up across the ground and sit on the balcony is pretty cool and currently really enjoying it. Yeah, so I'm very familiar with the setup there because we spent yeah, yeah, a couple cool. of months living at the Aegeus Bowl for the cricket last last season. And for you, though, I mean, there must just be so much excitement. You're having to go through you know, a bit of a quarantine period, but it's what comes after it, which must be such an enormous carrot. Oh, absolutely. Like, to be fair, the quarantine's not really too much of a problem for me, at least. But I mean, at the end of it, the opportunity to play a few test matches in England and then India and being involved for all that and pretty... Spectacular grounds is once in a lifetime opportunity, I think. And everyone has a bit of a story about the support they get. I mean, nobody just becomes an elite cricketer completely on their own. What's your story in terms of the support that, that you've got from your family and the, and the influence that, that they have played on your cricketing career? It's, it does kind of understanding the amount of work dad has done for me specifically in cricket. Since I was started playing when I was five or six, he's been my coach throughout the way and he still helps me out a lot at the moment. Just the way, the, like, he's still throws flicker at me sidearm and so we talk about the game a lot like before every game we'll have a chat about it have a chat about other teams bowlers and stuff and having that relationship with him is amazing like and I'm eternally grateful for what he what he's done for me and he sacrificed so much for me to get to where I am and also my mum is incredibly supportive although not necessarily with the cricket side of it but she's always there she she bleeds for me um every success every failure but she rides all the emotions <laughs> But like, as most mothers do. Was it your father's love of cricket, do you think? Was that instilled in you? Both your parents came from India, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. So I was born in New Zealand, but my parents were born in Bangalore, brought up there. And have you played much cricket in India as well in, in the course of your cricketing development? Yeah, I have. I've, I've gone there quite a few times, actually. Dad does take like a couple of teams from Wellington most years, play like heaps of games, which is like amazing to get used to conditions and shows how cricket mad that, that country is. It's crazy. So with the Indian heritage, tell me, I mean, there's 
a, an opportunity to there's two test matches against England and then the World Test Championship final against India. Who would have your dad's idols been? And, and did you also, you know, watch a lot of Indian cricket? And you know, how special would it be if you featured in that Test Championship final? Yeah, growing up, the like the Indian heritage and stuff was definitely there. I think I idolised those Indian greats like Dravid, Tendulkar. Ganguly, Laxman, all those sort of guys, Kumble, those sort of players, watching them, like, obviously dad was in, loved them. And my, my two idols from the Indian team were Dravid and Tendulka. And that was dad, and actually mum's favourite. Mum doesn't really like Craig that much, but Dravid was her favourite. Th- those two definitely uh, inspired me. The opportunity to play against India is an amazing thing if I do get picked. To end with, just give us a sense of what it would mean to you to make your test debut in the coming weeks, because it's, you know, really not very far away now if you get the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, like it's something I've dreamt of when I was a young kid, like watching New Zealand play. And it would it would mean the world to me if I did get opportunity. And I'll just keep doing whatever I need to, to get keep improving on my game. Ratchin, so good to meet you and to speak to you. And good luck. We really you know, hope to see you in action uh, in the coming weeks and months. Amazing. Thank you, Alison. So Ratchin Ravindra, New Zealand 21-year-old all-round. I, I found him really bright and engaging. He was wonderful to chat to. I just wonder, Jim and Charlie, did you know much? Had you read much about him before hearing him just then? <laughs> well, I must confess, is uh, rushing out of the blue for me, uh, and, and why not? I mean, he he's, he's sounds wonderful, like a sensible, humble young man. Of course, if he ever does get a little more uh, arrogant, then we'll know that his sister will pull him down. So <laughs> he's in good hands there. But no, I, 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 I've been caught uh, completely cold with this. Uh, although, of course, we have a very strong connection with Bangalore being his mm, parents' indeed. home, and the fact that they actually get a team here every once in a while to play a few matches. I have no doubt that using the old six degrees of separation angle, <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> I know somebody who they know very well soon enough, especially if they were somebody involved in the world of cricket in Bangalore. But I must confess, no, I, I don't quite, I haven't heard of him or know his parents yet. Uh, maybe we should establish a connection, find out mutual friends here. But it's great that, uh, you know, a, a youngster who seems to be well grounded is hoping to get to play for New Zealand. And I think he's in a good spot because uh, if not as an opener, left arm. Uh, orthodox skills are always, um, uh, you know, held in greatest team in the world. So maybe that will help him too. And good luck to him. I look forward to seeing him in action for the first time, I must add. But that, that first test starts June the 2nd. And in a real positive note, 8,000 spectators a day are set to be allowed into Lord. So that mm. is a good thing. From the BBC World Service, this is Stumped on All India Radio. Now, the infamous incident of Sandpaper Gate has again been in the headlines. That's ever since Australian batsman Cameron Bancroft suggested this week that the Aussie bowlers knew about the ball tampering that happened in Cape Town in 2018. Now, you remember that Bancroft received a nine-month ban for using sandpaper to rough up the ball during the third test against South Africa. There was a year-long ban for David Warner, uh, along with the captain at the time, Steve Smith. No other players were punished or indeed deemed guilty for knowing about it. But in a UK newspaper interview this week, it was put to Bancroft. He's over here playing counter cricket for Durham. It was put to him that surely some of the Australian bowlers knew what he was doing. And when he was pressed, he said, quotes, it's pretty probably self-explanatory. Now, in response, Cricket Australia have said in a statement that it has maintained all along that if anyone is in possession of new information as regards to the Cape Town test of 2018, they should come forward. They also maintained that the investigation done at the time was detailed and comprehensive. They say since then, no one has presented new information to CA that casts doubt on the investigation's findings. Now, the four Australian bowlers in that match, Pat Cummins, Josh Hazelwood, Mitchell Stark and Nathan Lyon, then took the unusual step of issuing a joint statement denying any prior knowledge of the ball tampering incident. And it was pretty strongly worded, talking about rumour mongering and innuendo and maintaining allegations that they knew anything were being made, quote, despite the absence of evidence. So what do we think of all this? Because I mean, the reaction on social media to Bancroft's comments in many quarters at that time, looking through them, was, well, of course the bowlers must have known, like nothing surprising, almost a sort of acceptance amongst many in cricket that well of course they knew but it was just it was sort of the three main protagonists who were actually punished but I mean the bowlers have been very very strong Jim in defending their corner haven't they yes um it was pretty apparent uh, when I was talking to someone well connected to uh, one of those bowlers the other day that um whatever you do make sure 
he sings from the same hymn sheet as the other ones. Otherwise, they just put more petrol on all this. Um, on the one hand, Cricket Australia just want the thing to go away. Uh, they're satisfied that what they've done is enough. A lot of people are, are waiting for David Warner to come up with his book. So more will be revealed. But I mm. think uh, most of the punditry in, in the world of cricket think that at least 10, 20, maybe 30 people knew what was going on. Um, but um, at the time, they just did what they needed to do in terms of investigating it and, and wanted to move ahead. The investigation didn't actually interview no. the bowlers, did they? No, no. They didn't go past the, the chief uh, culprits. It's been intimated by Darren Lehman in various stages, certainly by the bowling coach, David Saka, that, yeah, maybe some other people knew what was going on. Uh, but the, the whole thing was such a clumsy ruse. I mean, if they were, as I've said before, applying sandpaper to the ball uh, in in such a way that uh, it was changing the condition of the ball, the umpires would have known. So I, I don't think they were doing much with it. What will be interesting, as I say, is when David Warner retires, brings out his book, I think you'll hear a bit more about that bandaging he had on his hand and perhaps a little bit of sandpaper in there that he was using um, in not just that game, but mm. in other games, going back to the Ashes. Now, you know, ball tampering, so what? Um, but but the, this was a problem for Australia, not because of the ball tampering, because of the way Smith and Bancroft and Warner um, brought the game into disrepute by telling Porky Pies at a press conference. I was sitting next to a judge on one side and Mark Taylor on the other today. And as I said to the judge, it's the same law, isn't it? Law 11, don't get caught. <laughs> You're right. It wasn't as much about the integrity of the behaviour in the immediate aftermath as the actual you know, incident of, of, of tampering in itself and, or, or attempt to. Chari, what, what was your perspective uh, on all of this? Well, Alison, really, I mean, this is an extraneous object. You don't go into the field of play without a fairly large number of your teammates and support staff knowing the game plan, because otherwise you can be accused of, of ruining the game plan if you're taking something in that others don't want. So there's no doubt that many more people did know about the ploy. Of course, the jury may be out, as, uh, as uh, Jim alluded, that did it really help the bowlers or not? Well, we're not really going into that, but the, you know, the television camera spotted what they did, and some had to own up. But I also think that it's over now, all right? The horse is bolted. It's all over. Whatever little inquiry had to be done is done. We've got to move on and forget about it rather than witch hunting at this stage now, three years later, saying who else was involved. Mm. It doesn't matter anymore because I think those who got their punishment got their punishment. But there's no way that others did not know. I wanted to put it to, to Jim. The way it's all flared up this week is that served as a bit of a reminder that it won't necessarily really go away. I and mean, it's come timing wise, just at a point when we've had Tim Payne kind of endorse the idea that Steve Smith, you know, could captain Australia once again, you know, after he finishes up. Do you think this has resurfaced and damaged Steve Smith's potential to lead Australia again? I think as I suggested before, I think they'll want a clean slate and they'll move on from Steve Smith to someone else. Probably Patrick Cummins. I don't know, it might be Marnus Labuschagne. We don't really know. Can you imagine um, the timing of a David Warner is... autobiography, just as, say, Pat Cummins takes the captaincy, if there was to be something something in that? It's not going to go away, is it? It's going to be in the pub talk. It's going to be with the crowd. So <laughs> as long as Warner and Smith and the rest of them, I suppose, are playing, this is going to go around and around and around. That's why Cricket Australia just want to say, right, enough. We've done the investigation, mm. as Jerry mentioned. Let's move on. I do want to pick up on something else that uh, caught my eye this week to both of you, and that was around Indian batting legend Sachin Tendulkar. I can remember he retired in 2013, but he's revealed that he struggled with anxiety during his career and that he'd often have sleepless nights before games, but just accepted that that was <coughs> part and parcel of what he did. That was the way he, you know, had to prepare. That was always going to be there. Do you think, Cherry, that Sachin would ever have talked about this during his playing career? Because, you know, the, the importance and acceptance placed on mental health now, you know, internally within squads is so much better than it was during his playing career. I'm really happy that he's talked about it finally. Of course, well past his playing days. But I cannot imagine that he would have confessed to this during his playing days because there was so much made about how this one little five foot four individual bore 
the weight of over a billion Indians every time he went onto the field. Now, that's been storied, right? The fact that he took so much pressure on him because at some point of time, it was felt that he was perhaps the only go-to player on the Indian side, although that's a little disrespectful to all the rest who constantly chipped in. But yeah, it just, I think it once again reveals the fact that, as you mentioned, uh, just about every, and why at the top level, at every level, and maybe not crippling, as you said, because after all, they do go on to perform and, and win and get gold medals. But uh, many will admit that certainly at night, they don't sleep easy before a big match. But uh, I'm glad that he's, he's said this, and maybe he'll become a spokesperson to make sure that others do not have to go through the same level of anxiety. Um, and just a, a final thought as regards India, because we've heard that India's women are going to be playing a multi-format series against Australia in Australia. Now, India's women haven't played a test since 2014. They're now, Cherry, going to play two this year against England and then Australia. Is this, I just use the word phrase, window dressing, but I mean, so much investment is needed, isn't it, in India women's you know, domestic game, women's IPL, how much difference is playing a couple of standalone test matches going to make? I would like to believe still quite a bit. It's better than not playing them at all. Because yes, as you mentioned, so much more work needs to be done in India for women's cricket. But the fact that they can play even one-off test matches against the bigger, better countries is what the girls will certainly want. Because, I mean, it is the true test, isn't it? Are they prepared enough? Obviously not, because India, especially the women, and haven't really had much practice at all, but maybe later in the year they would have done enough. And uh, they, to my mind, are actually pound for pound not too badly off. And we love to hear from all of you throughout the week here on Stumped. We're at BBC WS Sport on Twitter. Make sure you use the hashtag BBC Stumped so we can see all your comments. And don't forget you can download the podcast every week from your usual podcast provider. If you search for BBC Stumped, you'll find us there and you can hit subscribe as well so that you don't miss a thing. Well, that's all we've got time for here on All India Radio for this week's Stumps. My thanks to my co-hosts, Charis Sharma and Jim Maxwell. And of course, to you all for listening. Make sure you stay safe and see you again next week. Bye-bye. Stumped is a BBC sport production for the BBC World Service in association with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and All India Radio.